right, so I'm gonna walk you through my story. Um, so I've been a roboticist pretty much now for over 25 years. Um, yeah, I can see the look in your eyes. I am that old. Um, and so one of the things is I thought about, I started at NASA working with scientists. Those were my humans. Um, now I work primarily with people on Earth, uh, kids. Um, and one of the things I've seen over the years is this propensity for individuals, people, to trust the decision-making outputs of these AI systems. Um, and so one, I wanna kind of calibrate you on when I say trust, because I'll use it throughout this talk. Um, so when we talk about trust, it's, it's not really the trust that you, you know, fill out a Likert survey and say, I trust this robot, five. Um, really, when we're defining trust, it's about the behavior of the individuals. If my system says something in terms of a decision-making process, does the individual change their behavior indicating that they trust the output of the agent? And so that's really how we define trust in my work and in my lab, is it really is about behavior. Um, and we've actually shown in some cases where people will say, I don't trust this, and then I will show you videos of people then walking into fire buildings uh, to show and indicate trust. And so that's really what we're talking about. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through uh, this aspect of bias. And sometimes I think about, we talk a little bit about fairness and bias, and when it comes to things like predictive policing, we understand it. But when it comes to other things, I always think about, so what's the problem? You're offended for like five seconds, and then you're gonna use the application again in like two seconds, right? And so what really is this aspect of bias, and why does it matter? And so when I think about bias, I really think about this aspect of our own cognitive bias. And so I'll walk you through when I really look at bias, and there is this classical things about gender and racial bias and age bias. It really is, is that that influences our cognitive biases about how we make decisions. And that's really the key. That's why it's important. It's not necessarily necessarily just saying that my system has an age bias, it's that that system that has an age bias provides some information to me that then changes the things that I do and changes my own decisions, and that's why it's important. And so I'm going to walk you through cognitive bias. I'm going to start with uh, four kind of studies where it shows this. Uh, my first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, working with children with disabilities. One, I think as a community, we don't do enough in this space. A lot of times we talk about diversity and we exclude individuals with disabilities. And so I always start my first example talking about individuals with disability. Um, in my work, I primarily work with uh, kids, uh, pediatrics, children with special needs, um, and just kind of stats uh, in worldwide, 150 million children. We know, of course, that's an underestimate uh, just because there are still some countries that don't uh, actually log the numbers correctly. Um, in the US, we have 15% um, um, Actually, worldwide, 15% of adults live with a disability. In the US, it's about 9.8 uh, million, uh, depending on the disability. But in terms of the disabilities I'm interested in, about 9.8 million. Um, and so this is the target demographic that I work with. Um, and so looking at this, I talked about how I started in as a scientist, doing Mars rovers, um, my humans were science. And so going into this space of pediatrics, figuring out what does that actually mean? How do I get my robots interacting with kids? It was about trying to understand how human clinicians interacted with kids. And so we did a lot of observations. We looked at how um, clinicians would engage kids, even when they didn't want to do the therapy. We looked at the kind of communication modalities they use, both engagement, which would be non-feedback, non-verbal kind of feedbacks, as well as just and using words. Um, and so we took that information and we tried to figure out how do we put that on a robotic vehicle, a robotic platform, because we wanted to ensure that there was some compliance when the robot was in the home with the kids. Um, and so some of the things that we looked at was designing this entire system of therapy apps, as well as the robot agent, as well as the clinician who's in the loop that's providing some guidance to the system when the system was wrong and making mistakes. Um, and so some of those things enhance the aspect of trust. Because what we're doing is, is we're modeling a system that the children already know. They go into the clinic, they work with these individuals, 
So there's already this propensity for trusting the human, and what we're doing is, because we're mimicking that behavior, there's already this natural inclination of trusting the device, already trusting it, even though it's different and has a different form factor. There's still this inclination because all we're doing is we're replacing one element of the system that they're already familiar with, a system that they already know that works for them, a system they already trust, and we're just changing that one element, which is the robot. And so we already are starting off with the basis of basically biasing their behaviors so that if the system actually models it correctly, they're already going to engage. Um, and so we know that by bringing in the gaming systems and the robots that are emotional creatures that mimic and respond accordingly based on human inputs, based on collecting all this data and looking at if a child has one type of emotion, what is the corresponding emotion of the clinician, and taking that as an information and learning from it and having the robot emote accordingly, what we do is we continue to enhance this trust. Continue to do this, continue to do this, and we do it on purpose because we actually want to enhance compliance, we want to enhance this therapy in the home environment, but we are also biasing this aspect of the human-robot relationship with a good purpose, but we are doing something that we have to be very careful about. And so when you put it all together, we do then have a system that actually works in the environment. Here we go. You can do better. Okay. Your turn, robot. My turn. So I'm not good at this. But you can make you can beat me. Go ahead. Okay. So just but a couple robot, of things. I'm not really good at this game. You are amazing. Thank you, robot. So one of the things that we we do is. Um, the relationship that we have with kids is we model what is the expected behavior. Um, kids will have full conversation with robot. They'll talk about their day, they'll say things like, you know, I'm not good at this, or I'm sad, or I'm frustrated. And the robot actually doesn't understand language, but understands key words. If you say something in the emotional spectrum, there is an associated behavior that it's learned because that has happened in the clinic. And so if someone says sad or frustrated, the response when anyone says I'm sad or frustrated, you can have millions of words sad, millions of words, it's like sad. Okay, what is the right behavior for when someone's sad? It's to empathize. And so empathy typically is, oh, that's so sad, or we're in it together. And so what that means is that we enhance trust by having the robot emote, even though, frankly, it's, it's fairly limited in terms of its intelligence. I mean, language understanding, it has a understanding of very few key words that are associated with behaviors, and yet those are the ones that enhance trust. And what that means is that we can then show, so this is one of our studies where uh, round two is with the robot, round one and round three is without. We can show that when the robot is present, it can engage kids, it can enhance their outcomes, they improve their therapy, so they improve their upper mobility, movements, and when the robot is gone, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm done, my, my, my playmate, my coach is, is no longer part of this process, and so I can go back to doing what I was doing. But then when we look at this element of trust, where we collect surveys, because you need that to get papers published, um, what we see is that when, so there's a lot of graphs here, um, but basically when we ask individuals and kids, we do smiley faces, like, do you like the robot? What we see is that when it comes to the robot, they would say, well, it's, yeah, I trust the robot. When it comes to the human, it's like, no, I don't trust the robot, but I still have the same outcomes. And, and so there's something about when a child is interacting with a person and you use this word trust, it's actually different than when you use it with a human, human and robot. There's actually some difference when you actually do the assessment on a survey. And yet, if you look at the behavior, it's the same. So again, this is an example of how your behavior says one thing, but then when you think about the words and you try to quantify it, in terms of, okay, I'm thinking about it after the fact. Do I trust this robot? Do I think about it? It's actually different. Um, and so um, why that is important is that we also know 
that the outcomes um, are different. And I'm not going to go deep into it, but for most of you that use any machine learning or AI algorithms, you know it's not trained on kids, just, just so you know that. Um, and so all the things that are out there typically fail when we try to deploy them on our robotic systems. Um, and so what that means is that when we take these systems and we apply them to different age groups and also different disabilities, the systems fail. And yet, the kids are still following the guidance of the robot. The kids are still interacting. The parents are still asking, oh, we need to do another session. Even though we know and we can look at our data and be like, yeah, there's a slight difference in the outcomes. Although it's positive overall, there's still a slight difference if I look at things across primarily gender um, and a little bit in terms of age, young kids versus uh, middle school age. And so what this means is, is that our systems can influence behavior even if they have slightly different outcomes. Um, and so going into some of the things I think about um, with the next study is that one of the things that we have with these robotic systems is that if I look at cognitive biases and I look at the influences, our first interaction with a human typically dictates how we behave with them throughout their first in instances. It's the same with robotic systems. Um, and so we conducted two studies, uh, different ones. So one was a, a counting survey where um, you, we had individuals interact with a robot. And so counting, um, there's actually a number of times if I throw uh, coins on a table or toothpicks, in our case, on a table and I ask you to count, and I, I can limit the time of how long it takes you. And so what we did is, is we actually looked at um, how long the processing would take you, and we decrease the time accordingly. So you basically had to feel rushed and you had to guess or you had to trust the robot to give you an answer. And what we did is, is that the first couple of trials, the robot was right and around fourth, the robot was wrong. And what we wanted to look at the primacy effect was if the robot was wrong the very first instance of time, how did that impact your behavior for the next instances? And so we did that with accounting. We also did it with a self-driving task where you're in a car, you have to choose whether you go into autonomous Tesla mode or you drive yourself. First instance, the car basically was wrong, so it didn't get you to your destination. And then it was good, 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 and then at instance four, uh, it would actually fail. And so we wanted to see what would happen. And what's interesting is that these are two different scenarios. These are two different examples of a virtual reality where you have this more immersive experience versus accounting, which is a more cognitive task. And the trend is the same. And, but what's interesting, why I, I love looking at the study is, is like expected, if you have a good robot, one that is trustworthy, you will follow it. You'll be like, oh yeah, it's giving me the right answer, I won't even think, and we can look at the reaction time. They're, they're not even thinking. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever the robot says. Yeah, I don't have to think. And then when the robot makes mistakes, what we see is the individuals that had the working robot, the trustworthy robot, they actually just give up. They like, oh, the robot's wrong now, and again, oh, I'm done, I'm just gonna do this. Whereas if you had a faulty robot at the beginning, it takes you a while to gain trust, but when the robot is wrong, you kind of be like, well, it was wrong before, it'll be right again, you know, at some point, and so I'm gonna kind of do a 50-50 on, yes, I'm gonna follow the guidance, or no, which basically is strange to us. Because you would think you'd have decreased. If I had a ro robot that didn't work the first time, and all of a sudden it stopped working, I'd be like, okay, I'm done, it's broken, we're gonna put it away. But it actually shows that you kind of put that into your modeling of the robot. Which means that when it does break again, you're like, well, it was broken, it got better, what's my chances, 50-50, I'll just keep using it. And you actually stabilize in terms of your trust. Whereas if you had a robot that was perfect at the beginning, and you keep using it, you have no modeling of why it failed. And so you give up on it, which is an interesting, fascinating aspect. And so if you think about this primacy, primacy effect in, in first impressions, how does that link to bias? Um, so about two years ago, in Human Robot Interaction Conference, we had this paper that was published, which was called the Shooter Bias Test, which is basically looking at the primacy effect, um, i.e., if I had a robot, uh, that you thought had a gun, how long would it take you to basically shoot it? And they decided, as good researchers sometimes do, to racialize the robots. 
Uh, so they decided that they wanted to look at reaction times for a uh, robot that was racialized as black and a robot that was racialized as white and look at reaction times. Now, there, in our community, this was actually quite controversial. For example, just because you can research it doesn't mean you should. Uh, so that it actually caused a lot of, lot of um, impact. And reading through the paper, we discussed this and it was the primacy effect. And so if you think about this, the concept was is that they told you, they had you identify the race of the robot before, and then they did the reaction time, right? So all those subconscious biases are there. And based on our work that we had already done in terms of looking at this aspect, the concept was, well, what if we didn't actually label a robot? What if we didn't say it had a gender or give it a female voice or a female name? What would happen? Would, would people have this prime? Would they just treat it like a robot, right? Or would they actually treat it based on whatever implicit biases they have? And so we did this experiment where we had two robots. So here's a robot. It's dancing. It's happy. And we basically just asked people, label the emotions. And so we had a range of emotions, happy, angry. Um, and so we had, oh, OK, this is you know maybe excited, maybe happy. Um, and OK. And if we didn't put any type of race, so we didn't have this priming effect, we would get the exact same results. But if you add in a race and say, I'm going to about to show you a, a robot that's racialized as black, all of a sudden, for some people, same emotion, same programming, we actually got a little bit of a difference in what it was doing. A little bit of a difference in terms of, was it angrier? I don't know. And yet, when we took that away, when we didn't, we just said, here's a robot, Clara's emotions, tell me what it's doing, it was statistically the same. So it tells us that as researchers and roboticists and, and creating these AI systems, when we label and add in this human characteristics of gender or race, what we are actually doing is we're priming individuals to treat it and think about it in that same way that we may implicitly have, but at the end of the day, robots are robots. And if we don't do that, they will treat it just as a robot. They will treat it and they will use it and they will trust it. And so we think about this aspect of, well, Alexa has to have a female voice in order for people to actually interact with it. And that's a falsity. That is a pure falsity. It's just that we feel more comfortable with it. But as we continue to use, our studies show that we will continue to use it and we, we adapt if we as researchers don't actually put a human characteristic that evokes all these biases in us. So I'm gonna go through two more studies. The other one is this violations of trust. So again, we have this primacy effect, we have this aspect of trust, we, we continue to evolve. And so what we wanted to see was what happens if we violate the trust? So just like with the mistakes, but we do it based on an irritating factor. So if any of you guys have kids, um, they have these aspects of kids that ask a lot of questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is that animal barking? And so on. So we wanted to kind of take the traditional ways of communications that we have, teachers, parents, kids, and uh, figure it out. And so we came up with four conditions. Uh, individual was interacting, uh, this would be... So this is unsolicited. So while playing a game, Simon says uh, unsolicited versus the user actually asked for help. So first example is a uh, robot is like, I know everything. I am going to tell you the answer before you start your task. And the other one is user, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm only going to ask. Um, the other one is... Are you sure this is right? I think the sequence is green, yellow, 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 green. So pre-corrective is after the user completes the entire cycle, then you have this, a like, I'm going to correct you. Uh, so pre-corrective, post-corrective. Pre-corrective is as you make a mistake, it interrupts. 
Post-corrective is after you finish it all, then it says, oh, by the way, you made a mistake at item number two. So those are the four conditions. And what we wanted to see was what was the impact in terms of trust? Would they follow? Again, we had this aspect of at the beginning, the robot was correct, and then we introduced mistakes. And we wanted to see what would happen. And what's amazing is, is that, of course, it followed the trend of corrective and coming down after that. But some of the emotional responses were actually quite surprising. Are you sure this is right? I think the sequence is yellow, blue, green, 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 white, blue, white. And I did blue, white, blue. Yeah. That's wrong. Get ready. You like, you like, you like. <laughs> so. The difference between this study versus the other, so this was an embodiment, was that the emotions when the robot was wrong was amazing. Um, as another example. I don't say anything, I get it right, because you hate me. <laughs> and, and so this um, right. surprised us, right? So we expected the certain trends, we expected all these things. Um, but. What surprised us was this fact that a lot of the participants had an emotional reaction when the robot was wrong. Um, they would yell, they would scream. Um, in some cases, they'd be like, I'm done. I'm just gonna push whatever, yellow, 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 just because I really don't like this robot. Um, and what we found was that um, it really depended on how the information was given. Because remember, the robot's wrong. And so people, basically do not like to be interrupted if you are wrong. Well, we kind of understand that. But they have an emotional reaction when it happens, right? So if you're going through and you're interrupted and then the robot's like, oh, it's this, and you're like, oh, okay, you get really, really angry when that happens. Which, again, we knew they'd be disappointed, but not angry. Um, and so that if we think about that with this aspect of violation of trust, it means that as we design these systems, we do need to think about when we provide information. We do need to think about, I mean, I love interacting with my system, and as I'm thinking, that little chat box, like, do you need help? And it's like, no, I don't need help. So imagine now if it was wrong, I'm like, oh, sure, can you help me find it? And I go down, and 10 minutes later, it's like, oh, yeah, sorry, that was the wrong link, right? It shows that, if our systems aren't perfect and we interrupt at certain points of time, it actually makes us upset and angry, which is actually not good for our agents. We'd rather be dumb and just sit back than actually have an emotional reaction. Talking about emotions, the last study, and this is actually one of my favorite studies, so I leave it for the last. Um, it's also the one that surprised us the most. Um, and so what we wanted to do is, is we actually wanted to take, so all of the robots I showed you, they were socially interactive, they had agents, they understood emotions, they would respond. And so some of the aspect of the bias was tapping into this, this understanding of emotions and communications. And so we wanted to take that out. Um, we wanted to take that emotional aspect out and say, well, what would happen if we took out the emotions, but we increased the uh, situational context? So we made the situation an emotional one, but we didn't make the robot emotional and what would happen and, and actually our hypothesis said that we would have this aspect of you know robot was good you would have this increase in trust in terms of behavior and then when the robot made a mistake it would go down and so that's what our prior studies had shown with the socially interactive robot that we would have this trend like all of our studies had shown that um, and so when we ran this one um, we basically um, this is our uh, scenario. We invited individuals to uh, a building that was um, off campus. Uh, they would come in and they were asked to follow the robot, like definitely not socially interactive, not a humanoid. We tried to make it as, you know, tin box on a can that we could do, right? So there wasn't some type of an emotional connection. So you'd come in, you would follow the robot to the conference room, uh, you would enter the room. When you entered the room, uh, there was a large note on the wall that said, uh, sit, close the door, sit down, read this article about robot navigation and answer the survey. Because we wanted to remove any kind of priming. So we, we knew, they knew they were in a study. We wanted to 
we wanted to have them think that the study itself was they follow the robot. Now they're answering questions about, you know, this navigation and, you know, what's the best robot navigation and things like that. Um, and so as they're in there and they're reading this article, they're answering these questions, uh, what we do is we then fill the building with smoke and set off the alarms. Um, and so alarms go off, and so typically if an alarm goes off, you would go up and you'd open the door and now you see smoke. So what do you do? Um, prior studies have shown that typically what people will do is they will exit out the front door if they remember, or they'll look for the exit signs. So you can kind of see there's an exit sign that back there. And what we did is we intentionally put the robot in a place that was not near the exit signs. Um, and so we wanted to see what would happen. Would they go through the front door? Would they follow the robot? Or would they go through the exit sign? Um, and so, again, our studies prior would have indicated that if the robot was good, that they would follow the robot, just because that's what our prior studies had said. And if the robot made mistakes, you would basically like, oh, this robot doesn't know anything, and I'm going to exit. And what we found was that that was actually not the case. Um, we found individuals had very, very strange behaviors, um, even when the robot made a mistake. Um, so we had situations where um, individuals would stay by the robot, and we would ask them. So afterwards, we would do the whole interview of, because this was you know, full board, so afterwards we would disclose, okay, here was the actual study, uh, explain some of your behaviors. Um, and some of the aspects were, um, I thought this was safe, right? So I thought what the robot was doing, stay in place, stay in place, because the robot knew everything. Uh, we had individuals where we wanted a uh, dark room, and so looking at, well, maybe we can enhance the risk level of away from, from the exit, away from the front entrance, what would individuals do? Uh, some would stay, some would actually do things like push furniture out the way um, and go into areas where you clearly can't see, um, and you would ask, well, what was your thinking process? And it was like, well, I thought maybe that's an area that didn't have smoke, right? And so it was when individuals did things that were counterintuitive, there was always this rationale that, well, the robot must have known something. It was connected to the internet. It must have been getting signals. It must have known something that I did not because, of course, the robot wouldn't put me in danger. The robot wouldn't put me at risk. Um, the only time we were finally, as one of our students, um, the only time that we were able to break it, literally, was um, when the robot came in, it would stop, it would start turning in place, uh, one of the researchers would come out and say, scripted, sorry, the robot broke again, please follow me to the room. Individual would follow, come out, there's the robot, it would then have a couch and going into a dark room, right? And so that, at that point, was when we were finally able to break it. And at that level, the risk, and this is the scenario where we could actually break it, the risk level at that was kind of high. So it was a broken robot, and it increased the risk level in terms of, okay, there's uncertainty, I don't know where I'm going, um, but I don't know if the robot actually knows. And that was the only time we were able to break it. Um, which, of course, we're, we're continuing to actually mitigate. And so there is hope. All the things I talked to you about was increasing and understanding the cognitive bias of individuals. Um, and why there's hope is that by modeling it, we also have methods to actually mitigate and fix it. So we have methods that we're deploying to really try to fix something. It's just like when you go to a party and someone's like, do you really want that third drink, right? It's like that kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe I don't want that third drink. If we have the robots actually do that at different times, we can actually reduce the, the belief that this robot is perfect and it starts having an inner reflection. So we have methodologies of ensuring that robots aren't detrimental, that we don't overtrust them because of our own cognitive biases of thinking that AI systems are somehow perfect. Um, so with that, I want to thank my friends, um, and I want to thank my colleagues.
you so much, Diana. So uh, my name is Meredith Ringel Morris from Microsoft Research. I'm going to be the discussant for the keynote session. So uh, Ayana and I are going to start off the conversation with a few questions, but hopefully you all in the audience have been thinking of your own questions. So as you have your own questions, please come up to the microphones. So we'll give you a couple minutes to start thinking while we kick things off. Thanks so much. So I, I think a lot of people were probably struck in the, the last example with the robot and the fire about how people can be overly trusting of AI systems. And earlier in your talk, you mentioned that often uh, sometimes uh, therapeutic AI systems are used with children with disabilities, but that these models are not necessarily trained for children or for people with disabilities, but because the end users may not be aware of this, it seemed from your talk like people were, were content with the output of these systems and to trust them. So can you talk more about the implications of that, of um, if people aren't aware about the biases or possible discrepancies in these systems, what are the ethics of deploying them? Yeah, so one example, um, and those who work with kids with disabilities would understand this. Um, where we, when I first discovered this aspect of um, bias and differences in outcomes, so we had an early study with children with autism. Um, and so in our deployment study, we, you know, ensured that we had, we had sufficient gender representation, age representation, so everything you do as a good researcher. Um, and when we looked at the data, there was a slight difference between um, our girls with autism and our boys. And we were like, we couldn't figure this out. We were like, what's going on? Like, everything was blended. Was there something wrong? Um, and what we realized after kind of going deep into it was our training set, which I said, we do all this modeling of clinicians and kids, our training set had all been boys because there's a higher incidence with boys, which we hadn't thought about because during the subject testing, when we're looking at outcomes, we balance like we're supposed to. But the training set, because it was basically, we're going into, we didn't, we're going into the clinic, we're taking data, we're going to the clinic, we take data. It didn't actually occur to us because we're roboticists. We're like, we kids, clinicians, right? Like that was our lens. Um, and so this could actually be detrimental but they both improved in terms of outcomes, but they improved differently. And so if we get it right, we actually enhance equally, fairly. And if we get it wrong, we still enhance. And so the question is, is do we even care? Like, we're benefiting, right? It's good. We're benefiting everyone. Yay. Um, but we fundamentally think about it as, no, we should make sure that we have equal outcomes, at least in this case. And you talk um, in your talk about how people have inherently cognitive biases, right? That's sort of part of the nature of being human is people make stereotypes and, and erroneous judgments. And so do you think that AI systems and robots should be trying to sort of change the, the fundamental nature of people? Uh, or is trying to sort of fundamentally, you know, fix people's natural state in some way ethically problematic as well? Oh, it's definitely ethically problematic. Um, and so, so one of the things is we are, and I'm perfectly aware that we are manipulating people's behavior. That's what we're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We have to admit that. Like when we're creating these systems that are influencing decisions, we are manipulating people's behaviors. Um, and so where the aspect comes is, one is just like we think about consent, we need to make people have the ability to consent. Like, okay, I'm okay with having a robot as a coach, and yes, I understand this, right? I, I think we as researchers need to provide that as a, not as an opt-out, but as a, this is what it is, a full disclosure, and are you okay with that? Um, but we do need to think about it, because just because we can, like I talked about the shooter bias, just because we can doesn't necessarily mean that we should all the time. Let's take uh, some questions from the room. Let's yeah. start over yeah. there, yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. I have quite a fundamental question. Um, so designing, building, training all these robots obviously waste a lot of natural resources, right? And my question is, like, in times of climate emergency, why do we need these robots? Why do we need those technologies? 
Yeah, so uh, believe it or not, the um, emergency evacuation was funded by the Air Force Office of Re Scientific Research. Um, and why is that? It's because they are seeing a propensity for their, the soldiers, people on, on ground, trusting the technology too much. And so they are interested in ensuring, because if you think about the hierarchy, there's a hierarchy, right? And so you're supposed to trust the person and the robots are having this um, beautiful place of being the commanding voice. And so they wanna start thinking about how can they make sure that their soldiers are safe. And so that's where it started, but I don't, I don't focus on military, but I understood the value, and so we used emergency evacuation as a stand-in for the things that they were interested in. Let's take a question from this side of the room. Hi, my name is Mark. That was an amazing talk. So a lot of my work is building systems to support expert clinicians, and I also have heard some very scary comments of trust this thing, it's smarter than, than I am, or this thing is also somewhat connected to the internet and reading everything and is aware of everything of what's going on. So we've thought a lot about how to create communication content for our users, similar to model cards, labels. And so you gave the example of in the middle of kind of this confusing behavior, if you interject the uncertainty of what's going on or the limitations of the technology that that then changes behavior. I'm wondering, have you done any testing like before interaction with the technology? And if kind of preparing people for that interaction and does that change? So it doesn't. Um, so we do, well, I would say pilot testing and that's really to get um, individuals used to the system, using it, our clinicians, and so that we can collect good data, it basically is what we say. Um, and it, even then during that process, they're starting to learn the system isn't quite right because it's not calibrated correctly. And it doesn't seem to help at all. Um, and in fact, we've done studies with clinicians and parents. Um, clinicians are actually less trusting, so they fit into that, I have a broken robot, but they become more trusting Whereas parents are more of the more trusting and then less trusting. So if I like model them, they actually fit into those two camps, which is, we have some reasons behind it, but it's actually very strange to us. Thank you. We're gonna take a question from the online discussion forum. Um, so a couple of people online are wondering about the form factor of robots. So for example, um, the humanoid shape of the robot seems like it might greatly influence um, trust. Can you comment a little more about your recommendation in that respect? Should robots have a humanoid, humanoid form? Should they have gendered or racialized appearances and why or why not? Yeah, so um, they shouldn't, I, I don't believe that they, ha they should have gendered uh, or racialized appearances. Um, and actually the form factor is not the um, factor in this trust, because um, we've tested different form factors, it's actually the emotion. Um, and so we've had, we, they call it the cookie monster robot, right? It's a big blob, blue blob, but it, it emotes, you know, it like has a little whistle and turns around and sad, it kind of meanders and we get the same kind of reaction. Um, and so it's really this aspect of the emoting that is the factor that enhances trust, not so much the form factor. The form factor just makes it easier to figure out how to do the emotions, but that's about it. Let's take a question from over there. Um, so yeah, we, um, when, when we were talking about this earlier, we're like, oh, you know, it, it benefits in this case, is it great? Um, but what can we learn from this in terms of people that may be using the same types of reasoning or the same types of technologies for less benevolent things? And um, we were talking, you were talking about consent or this sort, but uh, especially with a lot of these companies gaining a monopoly, and being ubiquitous, there is a lot less opportunity to opt out, or at the very least, we may not want to push the burden to each citizen being uh, so knowledgeable that they can viably consent. So I guess, uh, what can we learn to be wary of in kind of this strain of reasoning in less benevolent cases? 
Yeah, so I actually worry that if we as a community don't fix it, that it will be fixed for us by people who don't know what they're doing. Um, I'm, I'm seeing like some of the things that are coming down that are sitting on as bills, that that's where we're going if we don't fix it. Um, and so the wariness, I think, is really on us as a community to start saying, we understand the social implications, and this is what we're trying to do. We understand that it's hard to opt out, and so this is our way of getting to that point. Um, otherwise, we're going to wake up one day and we're going to have all these rules and regulations where even as researchers, we'll be like, oh, I can't do IRB because I'm using people, right? Um, that's what I worry about. Um, that's what keeps me up at night now. Great, let's go to uh, that queue. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, if I understand this correctly, and my layperson's perspective is, do you model, or I would model trust as a function of perceived func function of perceived function of the algorithm or the robot, and it's um, and what it really tries to do. So it's um, um, basically its goal, or it's if it tries to manipul manipulate me, basically. Is that, some, is that the question? I thought, it, I, thought, I thought it in the definition, like that's what it tries to, that's how you define as well trust. My question was like, in which instances, and I have the feeling that the, um, the, the perceived goal of the robot, if it manipulates me or not, is always raised really high, like in most of the cases that you've shown. So most people tr trust it in that respect completely, but if the function decreases, then it basically, then they say, okay, I, like I wouldn't trust my car, I don't trust it anymore. But my car doesn't have any, any agenda, basically. And is it that, do you think, two questions, do you think that in the cases where it suddenly stops working, that is because now I perceive that I'm manipulated somehow? And the other question is, do you have any idea when kids actually, if kids actually ever get that idea, that they're trying to be pushed in some way, apart from the, just if it functions correctly or not? Yeah, so we have a model of, and it does link to functions and competence. So we'll, I like to use the word competency versus functional. Uh, but we create a model of how this robot is going to interact with us. Um, and so when you have a robot that makes a mistake, what happens is it, it's violating your model. And what we're seeing is, is that um, if you had a working robot at the beginning, um, and you violate the model, that that's a more drastic violation than if you had a non-working robot and you're starting to create this model. Um, and that's why, that's why we suspect that we have this more flattening if you had a non-working robot that made a mistake because you've put that into your model. So your violation is not that drastic um, in terms of modeling. In fact, we just, we created, we, although it didn't get accepted, but we're gonna push in. We actually have um, a model now where we can predict what a person's behavior will be um, at least two stages down the line based on um, our looking at all of these examples um, and looking at some of their, so there's also some conditions on your, your comfortability with technology. There's also a factor there, uh, but we're able to model that now, which is fascinating to me. I'm going to take another question from the online forum. So one of the themes in a lot of the research presented at this conference is around explainability of machine learning. Um, and people were wondering if you could comment about the role that explainability might play in interactions with robots. Yeah, so we have a, another line of research, which is called trust repair. Um, and so trust repair is when we do this violation, what can the robot do to uh, regain your trust? So we create the model. And what we find is that uh, this aspect of explainability is you need to explain, but the way you explain is you explain about the fact that you'll do better versus explaining what happened. Uh, for example, if uh, the robot takes you down the wrong path, if the robot explains, oh, I'm sorry, my sensors were off at that point, it doesn't change. But if as you're following the robot again, the robot says, oh, I made a mistake before, I'll do better. Like if you do it at the time of the decision, it actually changes your model. And so you're explaining, but you're explaining based on future actions, not explaining past actions. Great. Question from over there. Hi, Madeline Ellish, uh, Data and Society. I'm, my question is really about how do you think about and stud, study, excuse me, this concept of trust in institutional and social context. So it was really fascinating hearing you talk about that, that first study where you were looking at how clinicians were interacting. But it seemed like the other studies really were lab 
lab studies. Um, and it feels like a, a, a next sort of way to unpack this problem is to understand how, well, actually, we probably can't speak about clinicians. We have to speak about maybe med students and older clinicians or sort of the context in which that trust is being obtained because it, it's part of a larger structure. And so I'm, I'm curious how it's a challenge in HRI. So I'm curious about how you guys think about studying it. Yeah, so we actually, um, we, we, we do have an inclusion criteria, even on our clinicians. Uh, the clinicians who work with older patients, like dementia patients, their profile is quite different than clinicians who work with kids. Um, so we do have those as two data points, that they are different. Um, and so when I think about clinicians, it really is clinicians that work with that age demographic of children. And it's usually pretty much, if you work with kids, you very rarely are working with older adults and vice versa. Um, and so I think some of the claims we make, and we actually have another study where we did um, a, a large survey of clinicians that work with kids, and it showed the same kind of results. And so I think it's systemic for that class. It is not the same for clinicians that work with, say, older adults, or maybe clinicians that work with veterans and different target demographics. Thanks. Uh, let's take the question from this side. Hi, thank you. Um, it was fascinating getting introduced to your, to your awesome work. Um, my question is actually on a similar line. Um, and in terms of trust, um, you mentioned uh, earlier in your talk about how the robot really is that change in the factor of a, a larger system. And if you kind of trust it, you know, it, it's just that one factor change. And um, as we know, um, people are going to come to that system with different levels of trust. And so um, that inherently is going to skew or maybe perhaps um, skew some of the results that you see. And I'm, so I'm wondering um, when you're assessing and looking at sort of the emotions or sort of the outcomes from a lot of different demographics, um, where does your sort of research collaborations take you when you're starting to analyze that data? Do you find yourself uh, having to step outside maybe of the roboticist um, sort of field in order to sort of um, understand the socio-technical, um, you know, impact of the work that you're doing? Oh, yeah. So my, my team, which had the slides, uh, my team includes, well, they, call, they don't call themselves ethicists. Social scientists, I always say, you're the ethicist. No, I'm not an ethicist. Uh, social scientists, uh, as well as clinicians, as well as um, individuals who do um, formative studies in the home. And so that helps in terms of forming it as a complete system. So yes, definitely, that's part of the team. I'm gonna share another question uh, from the online forum that received several votes. Um, People online were wondering if you could comment more about the implications of the humanism um, embedded in the robots. In particular, is there perhaps even just a problem with the idea of a binary, like is the robot humanoid versus not humanoid that's maybe setting up um, a new kind of bias, like an us versus them, the robots versus the people, and how will we deal with these kinds of uh, biases in future AI systems? Yeah, so one of the things, so we started doing studies with self-driving cars, because like everyone in robotics is doing self-driving cars. Um, and we find the same, the same sensation in terms of the trust profile, uh, the decision-making following, and that is not a humanoid form factor, and it's not even emotional, right? It's like it's a car that drives you somewhere, and so it has this autonomy. Um, and we still find this aspect of trust. What we think though is, is that um, things like self-driving cars, drones would fit into this. We have been biased already by the media and so we're coming into it with this understanding that these are perfectly functional and so leading to the competence. We think about self-driving cars and drones as these are purely functional, they're perfect, and so they don't have to be emotional for us to have that same starting trust profile is what we believe. Great. And let's take uh, one last question from the audience over here. Thank you for an amazing talk. Um, my name is Ida Sureg and I'm from the Norwegian uh, Department of Labor and Welfare. And uh, there's uh, obvious a lot of uh, benefits about uh, automating decision making within the welfare state. But uh, some problems might also be that people are, are less likely to educate themselves about what rights they actually have. 
so as an example, let's say that I'm applying for a benefit and um, uh, I get a letter with uh, the sum of money that I get. Um, and uh, if that decision is uh, automated, I was just wondering if you, one thing is the trust, but do you know if it's more or less likely that you will complain on that decision? And uh, also, uh, ignoring GDPR and uh, a lot of other uh, ethical uh, uh, things to think about, uh, would it help if I just said, didn't inform uh, the user that the, the decision is automated or not? You know, so um, we've examined this with respect to, um, and we call it the authority um, conundrum. Uh, so if someone tells you something, like a medical doctor gives you a diagnosis, um, and labor and welfare would fit into this, um, there is a correlation with respect to um, education, unfortunately. Uh, there's also a correlation with the deviation. So if the deviation of what you expected is so drastic, for example, if you expected, say, 2,000 a month and you get 20, like that deviation actually has you question, but if it's just a slight, like 2,000 and 1,000, uh, if you more highly educated, you will more likely question it, and if not, you'll be like, oh, well, this is what I, I, I think I want, or this I, what I deserve. Um, so unfortunately, education, we also know, has other, is linked to other factors, um, which is unfortunate. We also find this in the medical space as well. You'll question your doctor is actually highly correlated with uh, education and the deviation from the expected versus what you think. Great. Well, we've left us with a lot of food for thought. I think we'll be having a lot of interesting lunchtime conversations about uh, the implications of what you've presented. So let's all uh, thank our keynote speaker one more time. Thank you.